Hello, my name is Glenn Hall, and today is April 22nd, 2021. This is going to be my 11th video in the series, Passover, Not Easter. I had actually recorded a, an 11th video on Monday that is absolutely and totally different than this one. But uh, when I went to um, edit it after recording the whole thing, suddenly it all disappeared and was nowhere to be found on my computer. So I uh, <clears throat> considered that one, and um, I believe I'm going to bring that word next time, but I feel like the Lord would have me deliver a different word first. This particular video is called, We Have All Touched a Dead Body. We Have All Touched a Dead Body. This coming Sunday, April 26th, I guess it's the 25th on Sunday, 26th is Monday. The evening of the 25th begins the second Passover. And I recently did a video called The Hidden Feast because Second Passover is a very hidden feast. Um, not well known. Few people would celebrate it. And today I want to talk about some of the prophetic scriptures that deal with the meaning of second Passover. So first, let's go to the um, where Passover is, is implemented to begin with in Numbers chapter 9. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's not where it's implemented, but it is uh, for the second time, second year that they'll ever do it, occurs in Numbers chapter 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month, at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time. According to all its statutes and all its rules, you shall keep it. So you have to go back into the books of Exodus and Leviticus to read what God says about the rules of keeping Passover. And I went into those in detail in the uh, first videos in the series. So Moses told the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the people of Israel did. And there were certain men who were unclean through touching a dead body, so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. And those men said to him, We are unclean through touching a dead body. Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointed time? among the people of Israel. And Moses said to them, Wait, that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If any one of you or of your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall still keep the Passover to the Lord. In the second month, on the fourteenth day at twilight, they shall, they shall keep it. So he's saying you would keep it exactly one month later. And that's where we are now on this coming um, Sunday evening into Monday. We are exactly on the fourteenth day of the second month of the Hebrew year. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones, According to all the statute for the Passover, they shall keep it. 
But if anyone who is clean and is not on a, on a journey fails to keep the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. Now, it's interesting to me that God chose only two reasons for celebrating the second Passover or for celebrating Passover one month late, one month after it's supposed to be celebrated. And that is that if we touched a dead body or we were on a long journey. <clears throat> I believe that both of these, of course, are parables and both are prophetic and that they speak to all of mankind because the reality is that all of us have touched and are touching a dead body and all of us have been on a long journey. What is that long journey? That long journey is to get back to God, to have a relationship restored with God. The relationship that the Bible says Adam lost. <clears throat> so let's look at some scriptures that deal with this to help us see what this is talking about. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But in fact, this is verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, of course, we could read that and say, well, he's, he's only talking about people who have died physically, died in, <clears throat> you know, that their bodies have died. And in fact, when the Bible says that people have fallen asleep, that is what it's talking about. But I believe it's much deeper than that. And, and also, remember, there are, there are three deaths the death of the body, the death of the soul, and the death of the spirit. When, when Adam sinned, he, his spirit died. That's why God said, in the day you eat, that is the day you will die. And the death that we all have partaken of is that our spirits have died. And we can only become born again when we receive the earnest of the Holy Spirit and become born again. Let's look at a couple of verses that talk about this idea. John <clears throat> chapter 5 verse 19 so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, 
that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. He has passed from death to life. Let me read that again. Whoever hears my word. Do you hear Christ's word? There are so many now who say that they believe in Jesus Christ, but, but they're, they're only believing that he was a good teacher. It's so much deeper than that. Verse 22, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Then verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. You New Age prophets... Do you have life in yourself? Can you raise yourself from the dead? Can you raise another man from the dead as Jesus raised Lazarus? No, you do not have life in yourself. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So Jesus makes it clear that everyone who has not heard his voice is living in death. If we are living in death, then we have touched a dead body. So even though our bodies seem to be alive, at least physically alive, when we do not believe in Jesus, we are touching a dead body. Now I want to go to 1 John chapter 3. Verse 11, 1 John 3, 11, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Do you notice John is saying we could be like Cain. We could be like Cain. We could be, and if we're like Cain, we are of the evil one. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And so we see again that 
We live in death until we pass out of it through faith and obedience in Christ's word. Then I want to show you a couple of uh, scriptures. Ephesians 2.1 says this. This is Paul. Paul says, You were dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2.5 Even when we were dead in our trespasses, Well, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to go and read this whole passage in context. So let me pull that whole thing up. So Ephesians 2 and I will just start with verse 1 here. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That is, of course, Satan. He is the ruler of this world, and he is now bringing his plan, trying to bring his plan into fruition, his one world order plan where he literally destroys men and sets up his satanic rule over and earth devoid of what God has created. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By by grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus." so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul is saying this. While we were dead in our sins, Christ died for us. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. Well, what does it take to be made alive? Jesus told us, And I'll read it again because it's so profound and it's so simple. John chapter 5. A couple of times. Verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. And then verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you don't think that you have passed from death to life yet. You need to take time to hear Christ's word. That's what I did 44 years ago. I was looking for truth. 
I was reading Hindu philosophy, Krishnamurti. I was looking for truth. I was also living my own way, living the party lifestyle, but I was still looking for truth. And I began to read the Bible. And I read it every day, practically for three months or so, until one night in a profound revelation, God revealed to me that he wrote the Bible. When I came to the realization, I said to myself, God must have written the Bible. The voice of God spoke to me and said to me, that's right, Glenn, and I want you to teach my word. That changed my entire life. The word of God, the word of the Lord was revealed to me. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him, is what it says. Do you know the Lord? If you don't know the Lord, it's because the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to you. But he longs to reveal himself to you. He is the word. I think the problem that we have is that we all want to go our own ways. And we all want to be responsible for our own salvation. We want to do our own works to make it into heaven. Why do you think every church has its own rules and regulations to be a member in good standing? Many, in fact, most of which are not found in the Bible because they want to work their way into heaven. They want to be the maker of their own salvation. For them, even those who call themselves Christians, For them, Christ is the stumbling stone. They stumble over Jesus Christ because they can't believe that he would do it for them. But why why would he do it for them? Because we're dead. We can't do it for ourselves. We are dead. I still live in a carnal body of death. And I will until my body is glorified. We cannot do it ourselves. We cannot be perfect. You may think you can be perfect, but you just wait until the right temptation comes your way. Whatever it is, everyone evidently is tempted by different things. You wait and see whether or not you can be tempted. But instead of waiting, why don't you confess and say, I confess, Father, I can't do it myself. I can't make it myself. I will always be on the outside of New Jerusalem. I'm not good enough. And I can't be good enough because I still live in a body of flesh. What does Paul say? Woe unto me, man, that I, I, I always want to do the things I shouldn't do. Who will save me from this body of death? Who will save me from this body of death? See, we live in a body of death. And we lived in spiritual death until we heard the word. And when we heard the word, we woke up. But then we had a responsibility. And that was to apply the word to our mind, our will, and our emotions. To write it upon our heads and upon our hands. To learn it to make it part of us so that we would then do it. That's what that means. And so you see, 
we all touch a body of death. And so when Moses was asked about celebrating Passover by those who had touched a dead body or were on a far journey, that's the issue we're dealing with. And now let's look at a couple other scriptures that talk about this. Numbers 19, the red heifer. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, this is the statute of the law and the Lord that the Lord has commanded. Let the people of Israel, tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect in which there is no blemish and on which a yoke has never come. And you shall give it to Eleazar the priest and it shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered before him. And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. And the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its skin, its flesh, and its blood with its dung shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet yarn and throw them into the fire burning the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. And afterward he may come into the camp. But the priest shall be unclean until evening. The one who burns the heifer shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his body in water and shall be unclean until evening. And a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place. And they shall be kept for the water of impurity for the congregation of the people of Israel. It is a sin offering. And the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And this shall be a perpetual statute for the people of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns among them. Whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. He shall cleanse himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day and so be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not become clean. Whoever touches a dead person, the body of anyone who has died, and does not cleanse himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. What's the tabernacle of the Lord called now? New Jerusalem. And that person shall be cut off from Israel. That means he doesn't get in. Because the water for impurity was not thrown on him, he shall be unclean. His uncleanness is still on him. This, of course, is prophetic. It's a parable. Whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. You have touched the body of a dead person. And you have been unclean for seven days. Have you washed yourself? Were you washed on the third day? Were you washed on the seventh day? What do you mean, was I washed? <clears throat> you know, the church largely misunderstands almost every doctrine in the scripture. Let's go to, I believe it's 1 Peter 4.
Oh, here it is. It's in three. Okay. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. What? God went and preached to spirits in prison that we thought were going to be in hell forever? Is that what this is saying? Well, that's just another one of the doctrines that the church has wrong. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, when the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. What? Baptism now saves us? Well, see, that's why you get this doctrine in the church that if I just dunk you, if I just sprinkle you before you die as an infant, you're going to get saved. Another scripture we want to look at, Ephesians Ephesians 5, verse, starting with verse 22. I'll start at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, that is, set her apart for his use, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. By the washing of water with the word. The word is seen as water in scripture. And the washing of water with the word is what baptism symbolizes. So that he might present the church to him in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. The only way that the church can ever be presented holy and without blemish is that she has been washed in the water of the word. This reminds me of another one of the doctrines that some churches get into that, again, is a false doctrine. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and Peter said, oh, no, you shall not wash my feet. But, and Jesus said, you are clean, but not all of you. Nevertheless, if you will not let me wash your feet, then you shall have no part in me. What's he saying? I died for you so that you could become clean. And now you are clean because you believe in me. But you have to be washed with my word. Right now, I, as the Word, am washing your feet with water to show you in a parable what that means. The washing with water of the Word. Okay, so going back now to Numbers 19. Whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. 
He shall cleanse himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day. Has to wash on the third day and the seventh day. What do those two days represent? I'll tell you in a minute. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not become clean. Whoever touches a dead person, the body of anyone who has died, and does not cleanse himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. The Lord will not allow his tabernacle to be defiled. The Lord will not allow New Jerusalem to be defiled. Nothing unclean will ever come into New Jerusalem. And that person shall be cut off from Israel. Israel is the prophetic name of the overcomers. And they're the ones who enter New Jerusalem only. Because the water of impurity was not thrown on him, he shall be unclean. His uncleanness is still on him. This water of impurity had to be thrown on him just thrown on him on the third day and the seventh day. That's the washing of the water of the word. It's similar to the sprinkling of baptism that some people, the way some people baptize. And it represents the washing of the water of the word. And you have to be cleansed on the third day and the seventh day. What do they represent? Prophetically, the third day is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And on that day, he was offered as the first fruits to God. On that Passover, that prophetic Passover upon which Jesus died, he was raised on the third day. Crucified Friday, first day. Jews count inclusive, inclusively. So Friday's the first day. Saturday the second Sunday the 3rd, okay? Now, isn't it interesting, this year, this particular year, Passover is next Monday, the 26th. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday is the day after the Sabbath of this Passover, which is the biblical day of first fruits, and that is the prophetic day of resurrection for the second harvest, for the first fruits that come after Christ. Could it be this year? I hope so. It could be this year. This is the first year that I ever had this particular revelation. And I thank my wife for it because she is the one who suddenly mentioned it to me a few days ago. And I think it's very profound. The person who touches a dead body has to be cleansed on the third day, which represents, which Christ represented by his resurrection, and on the seventh day. Those people who are ready, those people who, I believe, walk in a perpetual state of cleansing, of being cleansed by the water of the word, are clean on the third day and on the seventh day. And when the time comes for this first fruits resurrection, on some Passover, they will be the participants of that Passover and death will pass over them and they will be glorified into new life. Then death is swallowed up in victory for them. And then they will take this truth to the entire world so that death can be swallowed up entirely because that's the prophecy that Jesus will destroy death, that that will be the last enemy to destroy. Now I have a couple things else I wanted to share with you and I just want to see where the time is in this one. We are about at 40 minutes, so it's about where I wanted to end, but this is so interesting. I, I want I want to um, at least briefly mention this. <clears throat> In Numbers 19, verse 6, 
you have this phrase that says, and the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet yarn and throw them into the fire burning the heifer. Well, this, this heifer, this red heifer, of course, prophetically symbolizes Christ who was fully consumed for our sin. But there's even another interesting prophetic thing here. This word scarlet yarn. In the Hebrew, the word scarlet is shawnee for crimson. And then the word that they're using for yarn here in the English Standard Version is the word tola, which really means a crimson grub, maggot, or worm. Well, what is the scarlet worm? Well, look at Psalm 22. And this is, this is why you have to read the word. Because if you will read the word, the word of the Lord will be revealed to you. Because you can't make this stuff up. How can this be? Let me start reading in verse in chapter 22, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who said that? Jesus on the cross. That's what he said to draw our attention to Psalm 22. Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Then verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. I am their creator and they despise me. I am a worm. That is the word Tola. The scarlet worm that was thrown into the fire for our sins. That's Jesus. That's Jesus Christ, our Savior. 